This is no one from nowhere and you are and I am a spirit of God. Today I want to talk to you about the biblical proof of Nibiru, Olam in the Bible and Anunnaki, the disappearing planet. This is part one of two parts. The next video will be about the consequences or the fate of planet Nibiru or Olam when it comes here. It's very real. Okay, the Strong's Concordance lists Olam at 5769. Olam means long duration, ancient futurity, eternal, everlasting, forever, old, permanent. And this is a noun masculine, and the key words are permanent, forever, and long duration. I want to point out that the Bible has been edited many times by many writers. Initially, it was Hebrew writers, and sometimes you have to find the root of words. In this case, Olam can be used as Nibiru. Remember, all roads lead to the Sumerian race and to the Anunnaki. Although there are no specific texts dealing with or describing Anus, Adobe, or Naribu, some idea thereof can be gained indirectly from such texts as the tale of Adapa, occasionally referencing to various texts and even from Assyrian depictions. It was a place, and let us think of it as a royal palace. This was entered through imposing gates flanked by towers. A pair of gods stood guard at the gates. Instead, Anu, or inside, Anu was seated on a throne with Enlil and Enki were on Nibiru. Or when Anu had visited Earth, they flanked the throne holding up the celestial emblems. In the Bible, Yahweh was described as seated on the throne flanked by angels while Ezekiel described seeing the Lord's image shimmering like electrum seated on a throne inside a flying vehicle. The throne of Yahweh is in heaven, the psalmist wrote in 11.4. Asserted and the prophets described seeing Yahweh seated on a throne in the heavens. The prophet Micaiah, who was like Yahweh, a contemporary of Elijah, told the king of Judea, who had sought a divine oracle. 1 Kings chapter 22. I saw Yahweh, or Enlil, sitting on, a, on his throne. And the host of heaven were standing by him, on his right and on his left. Biblical references to Yahweh's throne went farther. They actually stated its location in a place called Olam. Thy throne is established forever. From Olam art thou, the Psalms 93.2 declared. Thou, Yahweh, art enthroned in Olam. Enduring through the ages, states the book of Lamentations 519. Reconning, recognizing, however, that Olam is clearly a noun, the most recent translation by the Jewish Publication Society adopted eternity as an abstract noun as a solution. Olam, often accompanied by the adjective ad to denote its everlasting nature, was itself not an adjective but a noun derived from the root that means disappearing, mysteriously hidden. The numerous biblical verses in which Olam appears indicate that it deemed a physical place, not an abstraction. Thou art from alone, Olam, the psalmist declared. God is from a place which is hidden, which is a hidden place, and therefore God has been unseen. It was a place that was conceived at physically existing, Deuteronomy 33.15, and the prophet Habakkuk 3.6 spoke of the hills of Olam. Isaiah 33.14 referred to the heat sources of Olam. Jeremiah 6.16 mentioned the pathways of Olam. In 18.5, the lanes of Olam, and called Yahweh King of Olam, 10.10, as did Psalms 10.16. 10, 
The psalm and statements reminisce as the references to the gates of Anu's abode in Sumerian texts and to the gates of heaven in ancient Egyptian texts. Also spoke of the gates of Olam that should open and welcome the Lord Yahweh as he arrives there upon his kabad, his celestial boat, 24, 7 through 10. Lift up your gates, Lord, lift up your heads, O gates of Olam, so that the king of Kabad may come in. Who is the king of Kabad? Yahweh, strong and vigilant, a mighty warrior. Lift up your heads, O gates of Olam, and the king of Kabad shall come in. Who is the king of Kabad? Yahweh, Lord of hosts, is the king of Kabad. Yahweh is the God of Olam, declared Isaiah 40, 28, echoing the biblical record in Genesis 21, 33, of Abraham's calling in the name of Yahweh, the God of Olam. No matter, or no, no wonder then that the covenant, symbolized by circumcision, the celestial sign, was called by the Lord when he had imposed it on Abraham and his descendants, the covenant of Olam. And my covenant shall be in your flesh, the covenant of Olam, Genesis 17, 13. And a possible clincher for identifying Olam with Nibiru was this statement in Genesis 6, 4, that the Nephilim, the young Anunnaki, who had come to earth from Nibiru, were the people of the Shem, the people of the rocket ships, those who were from Olam. With the obvious familiarity of the Bible's editors, prophets, and psalmists with Mesopotamian myths and astronomy, it would have been peculiar not to find knowledge of the important planet Nibiru in the Bible. It is my suggestion that yes, the Bible was keenly aware of Nibiru and called it Olam, the disappearing planet. Moreover, in the biblical view, Yahweh was more than king lord of Olam, as Anu was king on Nibiru. He was more than once hailed as El Olam, the god of Olam, in Genesis 21, 33. And El Olim, the god of the Elohim, Joshua 22, 22, and Psalms 51, and Psalms 136, 2. Last, the Hebrew word for Olam means world, or eternal world. Trust in this, there is hope for believers. Psalm 103.17 But the love of the Lord remains in Olam, or Nibiru, and those who fear him, his salvation extend to the children's of those who are faithful to his covenant of Olam, of those who obey his commandments. This is a little taste. There's way more in the Bible and the Holy Scriptures about Olam or planet Nibiru. Sometimes you have to do your own research. I hope this helps you. God loves you, and so do I. And you are, and I am, a spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen.